Well, it is October, and it is spooky season, right? One thing uh, that you should probably know is that my wife is the Scrooge of Halloween. Before October hits, she's looking at the calendar and just lamenting and wishing that October would be over. So I thought I would open up my sermon this morning with a witch story. Does that work? (laughs) It's 1692, Salem, Massachusetts. Fear grips the town as accusations of witchcraft spread like wildfire. Neighbors and friends turned against each other, and at the center of this is my nine times great-grandmother, Martha Carrier. The crowd gathers in the square, whispering and glaring, convinced that Martha is not only a witch, but the queen of hell herself. The accusations against Martha have piled up. One by one, her neighbors turn against her. They point fingers at her, and they're driven by fear and frenzy. Then, her own children under duress and torture, were forced to testify against their mother, testifying that she was a witch. Now Martha stands before the court, her hands bound, her fate hanging in the balance. The judges, with their stern faces and dark robes, lean in, waiting for her confession. Most of the Salem witches confessed to spare their lives. Martha's heart must have been pounding. Her throat must have tightened. She knows what's at stake. The fear is overwhelming, the weight of the moment almost unbearable as she feels the eyes of the entire town on her. They've offered her a way out, the same way they've offered all these other women who have been accused. Just a few words, I confess. Her life could have been spared. The pressure on her must have been unbearable. Everyone around her is watching, waiting for her to break. But Martha does not give them what they want. Her lips stay sealed. She stands tall, defiant, refusing to lie to save herself. Maybe she remembered her neighbors who had turned against her or thought of her children scared and pressured. Perhaps it was her deep conviction that truth must stand no matter the cost. Martha surely drew strength from something greater, something unshakable inside of her. Even as the weight of the crowd's hatred pressed in, Martha could not betray the truth. The judges grew impatient, Her silence spoke louder than any words could. Now, what is the cost of her conviction? Death. But Martha doesn't flinch. She won't bend to the madness surrounding her. She knows the truth, and that truth is worth everything. It's worth standing for, even if it means paying the ultimate price. Could you stand like Martha, holding fast to your convictions? when everything and everyone around you is screaming for you to give in? Would you be willing to pay the price for what's right, even when it means death? Standing alone can be terrifying because we're wired to fit in. Think about school where fitting in feels like survival. From a young age, we learn what earns acceptance and what risks isolation. The pressure to conform is everywhere. It's at work once we graduate from school. It's even in our families. And we stay silent to avoid awkwardness. We go along with the crowd. We avoid tough conversations because we fear the consequences. Our culture prizes comfort and fitting in. We're told not to rock the boat. And the fear of being rejected or misunderstood is heavy. It's why so many of us choose comfort over conviction, even when deep down we know standing for the truth matters. So what gives someone the strength to face isolation, the strength to face hostility? What gives someone the strength to still stand firm? We've all had moments when standing up felt like too much. 
when the cost seemed too high. So how do we find the courage to stay true when everything around us is pushing us to conform? How do we choose conviction over comfort when the pressure is real and intense? That's what we're going to be exploring today. How do we tap into the courage to face overwhelming opposition? What makes the difference when everything is telling us to just fit in? If you've ever felt alone in this struggle, know that you're not the only one. We all face moments where standing firm feels impossible, and we're in this together. We're picking back up on our series through the book of Acts, hopping into Acts chapter 6, verse 8, where we read, Now Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen was just an ordinary man, but he surrendered to an extraordinary God. When we surrender fully, God uses us in ways beyond our imagination. In Jesus' heart, grace shows compassion. Power speaks truth. And Jesus embodies both seamlessly. When we look at this, grace and power, we often lean too far, either showing grace without truth or truth without grace. But Stephen, through the power of the Holy Spirit, chooses both. He embodies both. His life is a fulfillment of Jesus' promise in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where we read, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. Stephen stands in the fullness of the Spirit. He relies on God, not his own strength. If standing firm feels impossible, remember Stephen's example. True power comes from God. Let the Spirit do the heavy lifting. Amen? So ask yourself, do you live with both grace and power? Are you kind but afraid to speak up? Or bold but lacking compassion? You see, it's only through the Spirit that we can balance both. Jesus was gracious when people needed love and powerful when the truth needed to be spoken. We're called to be like Jesus. We're called to embody both grace and power. Opposition arose from some members of the Freedmen's Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenes and Alexandrians, and some from Sicilia and Asia, and they began to argue with Stephen. But they were unable to stand up against his wisdom and by the spirit by whom he was speaking. Notice where the opposition comes from. Who's opposing Stephen in this moment? It's not from the Roman government. It's not from secular society. It's coming from within the religious community. Those who should have recognized God's work resisted it because it threatened their status and comfort. Isn't it ironic? that those closest to God's work opposed it? Sometimes the resistance we face isn't from secular culture, but from religious environments. It's from churches that are unwilling to embrace change. Standing for Jesus means tearing down the idols of comfort and control, even when they're in our churches, even when they're what makes us feel safe. Our culture often pushes individualism and comfort above all else. We choose the path of least resistance because it feels safe. We avoid uncomfortable truths, believing comfort is going to bring peace. We avoid confrontation because we believe comfort, avoiding the difficult conversations, avoiding the truth, brings peace. But the truth is that it only leads to stagnation. But when we embrace the truth, when we embrace Jesus' truth, even when it's uncomfortable, that's what brings true life and purpose. Stephen's life stands in stark contrast to the religious leaders here. The religious leaders are more concerned with self-preservation than they are with truth. And so you and I, we need to examine where cultural influences push us to compromise. We need to evaluate 
whether we're prioritizing convenience over sacrificial love. We need to evaluate if we're avoiding standing out to stay comfortable. True strength is from God, even if it means standing alone. Standing for truth brings God's favor and the beauty of a life anchored in his purpose. The hardest places to stand firm are often within our own churches, with our family, or among our close friends. Have you ever been in a small group and everyone wants to avoid a difficult topic, but you know it needs to be addressed? Or you're at a family gathering and speaking up for what right means risking conflict. These moments are tough because we expect our loved ones to support us, but sometimes standing for truth challenges their comfort, their traditions. The members of the synagogue resisted Stephen because they were afraid. They were afraid of losing control, afraid of change, and their fear turned into hostility. When people feel threatened, those fears often manifest as anger or aggression. How many of you have ever said something, made somebody uncomfortable, advocated for something that was good and right, and the result was aggression and hostility against you? Often in the face of that hostility, we can take the wrong message. We can decide that what we did was wrong when what we did was right. Don't let the hostility of others cause you to back down from what is right, from what God is calling you to. You see, people are going to push back to protect what feels familiar. They're going to try to shut you down. They're going to try to maintain control. But Stephen responds differently. Stephen lets the Spirit lead him even in the face of hostility. Stephen stands firm without losing grace. We think that that strength to fight back, that's not strength. Stephen's going to respond here graciously. He lets the Spirit lead him. Are you willing to do the same? Are you ready to step out boldly for Jesus, even when it costs us something? We need to examine our own hearts. It says that the human heart is like an idol factory. That's what we're good at. We're good at creating idols for ourselves. One of our chief idols is comfort. Maybe it's the approval of other people. So where are we compromising in worship of our idols when God would call us to worship him? Where are you choosing comfort over conviction? What would it look like to let go of fear, to reject the idols, and let the Spirit lead? You see, Stephen's example invites us to trust God fully, to be filled with grace and power, and to stand firm, even when it feels like the world is against us. The religious leaders secretly persuaded some men to say, we heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people the elders and the scribes. So they came, seized him, and took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, this man never stopped speaking against this holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Stephen's opponents here, they're attacking him with deception. They're accusing him of blasphemy, just as they did with Jesus. Stephen is following in Jesus' footsteps. He's standing for truth despite betrayal. We believe the lie that standing alone leaves us vulnerable, but Stephen shows us the truth. Standing alone with God is not standing alone at all. Who better to stand with than God? When you're standing with God, you are in the strongest position possible. Amen? No matter who opposes you. Think of Asia Bibi, a Christian woman from Pakistan who was imprisoned on false blasphemy charges for nearly a decade. Despite intense persecution, she stood firm. And her story reminds us that with God, we are never truly alone. 
His presence empowers us to stand firm, even when everything is against us, even when we're sitting for years in a jail cell, which hopefully we will never experience. But God's presence is going to empower us to stand firm, even when we're facing pressures at work. The religious leaders clung to comfort and power, but Stephen clung to God. What are you clinging to? Are you clinging to power, to comfort, approval from other people? Are you clinging to God? Stephen chose truth. He was fueled by God's presence. And that's the lesson. With God, you're never alone. His presence brings strength and courage even when the world opposes you. How should we respond when misrepresented or lied about? Our instinct is to fight back, yes? But Stephen shows us another way. Stephen stays calm. Stephen trusts in God's plan. His peace came from this deep connection with God. It didn't come from his own strength. You see, for us, when we try to rely on our own strength, we're going to fail. Just like Stephen would have failed. But if we can develop a deep connection with God the way that Stephen has a deep connection with God, we're going to find tremendous strength. For us, that usually means carving out daily time to pray, to read scripture. When we build these habits, we're tapping into the same unshakable peace that carried Stephen no matter the circumstances. So often, we as 21st century American Christians do without immersing ourselves, grounding ourselves, rooting ourselves into Scripture. And we're weak. We're weak as a result. Rather than rooting ourselves in God's presence, we decide to win arguments. But standing firm isn't about winning arguments. It's about bearing witness. If you're shouting to prove a point, you're creating hurt. But if you're sharing truth with humility, if you're trusting God with the outcome, he will be honored. One of our natural reactions feeds pride. But when we reject our natural reaction, when we resist the urge to fight back, we reveal Jesus. You can try to do this out of your own strength, but you won't be reflecting Jesus. When you rely on Jesus, that's when you reveal him to the world. Now, if you want true peace, if you want to bear witness, you need to find true peace in prayer and scripture, making it a daily rhythm. You need to let God's presence be your strength when the world turns against you. You need to remember that you're never alone. Stephen stood for truth despite the lies, and in doing so, he found God's power. That's real strength. Stephen's story in Acts 6.15 gives us this incredible moment. It says, And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. You see, Stephen stood in this moment surrounded by a furious council, but instead of fear, his face radiated unshakable peace. Wouldn't that be amazing in those moments where we're tempted to fight if instead we could just radiate peace? Wouldn't it be amazing if instead of those moments where they want us to go away and to shut down and to avoid the conflict, we stood strong and radiated peace? Their reaction is stunned silence, at least initially. Stephen stands before those who hated him, but still reflected the peace of God. And you can do the same. Just like Moses in Exodus chapter 34, when Stephen's face glowed after encountering God, Stephen is filled with God's presence, and it showed. Stephen stood there, his life on the line, yet his face radiated peace. Stephen stood firm, knowing God was in control. God's presence did not remove the threat, but it did make Stephen's fear irrelevant. 
Stephen's strength came from abiding in God's presence, not from trying to perform well in that moment, which is another thing that you and I often try to do. Stephen wasn't trying to perform his way out of the situation. He just stood in peace. That same presence that filled Stephen is available to us today in every struggle, every conflict, every moment of chaos that we face. God is near and offering peace and assurance because he is sovereign We can find peace no matter our circumstances in our sovereign God who is in control of everything. Stephen stood calm and unshaken. He's rooted in his identity in Christ. He knows that he belonged to God, and that's giving him the courage in the face of hostility. We often are going to face rejection and loss in this life, but God sees every sacrifice and he rewards faithfulness. God's presence is with us and he honors those who stand firm. So here's the question that I want us to wrestle with. When we face hostility or misunderstanding, what do others see in us? What do others see in us in these moments? Do they see anxiety? Do they see defensiveness? Do they see frustration? Frustration is like my go-to. I think sometimes I'm the most frustrated person in the world. but I don't want them to see frustration. I don't want the world to see frustration. I want them to see God's peace shining through me. So what causes us to react with anxiety, frustration, defensiveness, instead of trusting God's presence? You see, what makes the difference here is how deeply connected we are to Jesus. If you want to reflect Jesus' peace, you need to cultivate an ongoing awareness of God's presence in our lives. That means making time for prayer. It means spending time in his word. It means inviting God into every moment. I'm not as good at this as I would like to be, but there have been times where things just seem to be going comically wrong, and this peace washes over me because I know God's in the midst of it. Like all these technology frustrations we've been experiencing here at church, God is present. God's present and he has a plan. Good things are happening in this room every week, whether the live stream is working or not. Whether we have slides or not. Now, we could just all get frustrated and storm out and and God's not really being honored in this moment. But if you can find the peace of knowing that God is above all of this, God's above our frustrations. He's above our fears. God can be glorified. But it's not always easy. In our conflicts with other people, in those situations where we are trying to stand firm for the truth, there's going to be moments where we don't know if we should speak or if we should stay silent. There's going to be moments where we're unsure of how to respond. Stephen is in a situation where clearly he needs to speak. That's not every situation. Sometimes God says, you've done enough. Stop arguing. Live at peace. This is where we need the Spirit's guidance to help us know when to react and when not to. We need to trust God to lead us, letting him show us what to do. Where in your life do you need to demonstrate this kind of peace? Where in your life are you not at peace, but the Lord would have you be at peace? Who's that person who's really rubbing you the wrong way? Maybe it's a group of people. It's one thing when it's like anonymous strangers. It's another when it's a friend. Imagine if we were able to have difficult conversations. If we were able to disagree, if we were able to be bold witnesses for Jesus without anxiety, without defensiveness, without the need to argue or debate, but instead showing a calm confidence. Not because everything is perfect in the world, but because you know God is with you and he's in control and he is working to make all things perfect. That's the kind of witness that changes hearts. We don't need to debate. We don't need to argue. If we're going to stand firm like Stephen, we need to address what makes it hard. One big reason is the pace of our culture. The world just moves really fast. 
Does anybody else relate to that? Anybody else just feel busy all the time? Okay, some of us are raising our hands. The rest of you, I wish I were you. <laughs> we move so fast. We never give ourselves time to pause and think deeply. Instead of being steadfast, we become reactive. How many of you just find yourselves reacting rather than thoughtful? Yeah? Okay, some of us. If we want to stand firm, we need to be intentional. We need to be intentional about spiritual formation. You see, Stephen didn't become full of grace and power by accident. He was deeply rooted in God's presence. To stand like Stephen, we need to create space for God to work in us. We're often moving around so fast that we don't take the time to be in the presence of God. The speed of our life is just one thing that gets in the way. The other thing that gets in the way is distraction. I am the king of distractions. If I'm not careful, I'll allow that noise to drown out the voice of God in my life. Who are you listening to? Are you listening to talking heads argue about politics? Are you listening to silly internet dramas, celebrity gossip? Or are you immersing yourself in the bigger story, the story of a God who loves you so much, who wants to be at peace with you, who wants to be at peace with the world, that he sent his son to die for you. Why are we wasting our time on petty, silly stories when we can be immersing ourselves in the big story? You see, all these things that we spend our days listening to, a lot of them are designed to create fear. How many of you are anxious about this election? Me too. Me too. I wonder if we would be as anxious if we turned off the talking heads and opened up our Bibles. What if we were praying about what's going on in the world rather than plugging into a 24-hour news cycle? What if we were reading about where our strength comes from not from a candidate, it's not from a party, it's from the Lord. I would love to face this election with just tremendous peace, knowing that no matter who all are elected or what propositions pass, God's in control. And I would love to be like Stephen and able to have difficult conversations about what really matters, about faith and not need to back away not need to debate, but to be able to stay strong. I would love to have a world where we can disagree with each other again, where we as Christians aren't afraid to share our story, aren't ashamed, embarrassed to share where we find peace to a world that is experiencing the same anxiety we are, perhaps more, about things like politics and the state of the world today, because we are grounded into the source of peace. These religious leaders, they are afraid of losing control. Something that we all fear. Nobody wants to lose control. And the thing for us Christians is we know who is in control. So we have to start living our lives like we know who's in control. We need to submit to him. We need to immerse ourselves in his story to remind ourselves of the bigger story. Standing firm doesn't start in a moment of pressure. Standing firm starts now. If you want peace in, what is it, three weeks? Start now. Read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Pray for outcomes, sure. But more important than praying for outcomes is praying that the Lord would do a work in your life where no matter the outcome, you are at peace. That's what we need. This isn't about becoming better versions of ourselves. This is not a self-help sermon. This is not a sermon about how to have peace in the midst of craziness. It's about something far deeper. It's about Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about walking with Jesus. It's about being transformed by Jesus. The strength that Stephen had, the courage 
that Stephen shows that didn't come from willpower or just trying harder. It came from surrendering to Jesus. That's where the real power is. Amen? We need to be about the gospel. Plain and simple. You see, Jesus is the root that keeps us steady when the winds are howling. When the storms of our life come crashing in, Jesus is the anchor that holds when everything else seems to fall apart. You can't do this on your own. You weren't meant to. Stephen didn't stand firm because he was some kind of super Christian. He was just like you and me, a normal, everyday, average Christian. Stephen stands firm because he knew Jesus, and that's what made all the difference. How well do you know Jesus? Maybe you're sitting here and you said, I accepted him to be my savior 20 years ago. But are you living with him as your king? Are you trusting in him as your Lord? Or is he just a get out of jail free card? It's not enough to be saved by Jesus from hell. We need to be saved by Jesus from the lack of peace that we experience now. And we do that by recognizing that Jesus is not just our savior, but he is our Lord, he is our king, and he is in control, amen? Let me make this plain. God knows you. God sees the battles that you're facing. He knows the pressure you feel to fit in. He knows the temptation to just go with the flow. But here's the truth. Jesus steps right into the middle of our mess. Jesus took it all upon himself, and Jesus carried it to the cross where it was nailed so that we could be free, so that we could be made new. If you're sitting here and you're thinking, I can't handle the chaos of the world, you're right, you can't. But you can be like Stephen. You can stand firm. And you can do that only by the power of God at work in you. And the good news is that you don't need to work to do it. Jesus already did it for you. Jesus stood in your place. Jesus took the punishment that was meant for you and for me. And because of that, we can stand, not in our own power, but in the power of Jesus. We can face the craziness and the hostility of the world because of Jesus. The gospel isn't about you trying to be good enough or trying to muster up enough courage. It's about surrendering to the one who is good enough. It's about letting Jesus live in you, letting his power shine through your weakness. It's about trusting that he is enough when you are not. Amen? So here's what I'm asking you. I don't want you to leave here today without making a decision. You've got a choice to make. Are you going to keep trying to do this on your own? Or are you going to surrender to Jesus? Are you going to let him be your strength? Are you going to let him be your foundation? Are you going to let him be your everything? He's worth it. He's worth giving up control. He's worth laying down your pride. He's worth facing the hostility of your friends and family in the world. He's worth letting go of your fears. Jesus is the one who will never leave you. Jesus is the one who will never forsake you. So come to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Let Jesus be your Savior. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your anchor in a world of craziness. Because when Jesus is in you, when his spirit fills you, then and only then will you have the strength to stand firm, no matter what comes your way. Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is worthy of all. Amen? Will you pray with me? Lord, looking at Stephen's situation here, I think so many of us would do whatever we could to get out of that situation. The temptation to back down, to lie, to denounce your name would be strong. Because, Lord, we have a self-preservation vent in us. Lord, we look at the craziness of the world and we try to find strength in ourselves rather than in you. Lord, so often when we're faced with these problems, 
these challenges, our instinct is to immerse ourselves in the problem, to immerse ourselves in the challenge rather than to immerse ourselves in your story. Lord, we live in a world filled of darkness, and we're too foolish to even look for the light. Lord, would you help us to find our strength in you? Would you help us to find our peace in you? Jesus, would we recognize you as our Savior? Would we recognize that you entered the craziness of the world, that you took the craziness and the hostility of our own sinfulness? You bore the punishment so that we could live at peace with you and each other. And so, Lord, would we step fully into that peace, recognizing you as our Savior, as our Lord, as our King, as our healer, Would we not be content with fire insurance? But would we be desperate for the filling of the Holy Spirit? For your glory.